Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm doing a follow-up video today on a video that I did yesterday. I suppose in time these two videos will not be together, so um, so it's not considered like part one and part two. Uh, but I did want to do a follow-up because I got so much feedback from that video that I felt that it needed to be addressed and the best way for me to address things is to uh, do a video uh, so that it's out there okay <laughs> so that it's out there for people to you stay there for people to uh, be able to utilize um, for many years to come uh, at no cost <laughs> my videos are always free uh, the first part that I need to address is I got uh, a, a good number of people that commented that I had done that video without one of my dogs uh, because most of my videos contain one of my dogs in the video so as you can see we have complied with that part of the video by um, inviting my daughter's dog here Lucky to uh, to join us in today's video Lucky is four years old she is part of Zeus and um, Bella's first litter of Labradoodles that we had, and uh, and my daughter kept Lucky. Uh, but to get onto the video part here, that is important, and that is um, in regards to the conversation in the other video, where one of my friends had a dog that was running, bolting out of the yard, ignoring the uh, invisible fence. Uh, that or underground fence. I don't know if it, I think invisible is actually a trade name So I'm not sure if it was that company or not, but it was it was running through the the uh, um, uh, underground fence that was there and, uh, and And they wanted to know if I could give them a solution to that problem and unfortunately I, I, I really couldn't uh, Because there's more to it than just you know turning on and off a button that stops a dog from running out of the yard um, and so my recommendation was for those people to find a professional dog trainer to help them. And it wasn't a cop-out because there really is more to it than just teaching your dog not to run out of the yard. Uh, that's the problem that irritates those people the most. That's the problem that they're dealing with that they're not happy about the most. But there's other problems that exist that are apparently not as important to them, they may not even notice it, that contribute to the problem that bothers them the most, and that's the dog running through the electric fence and out of their yard. And so when I recommend using a professional dog trainer, the reason that I, I say that is, uh, first of all, there's the obvious reason, but a professional dog trainer usually has a plan. Um, I'm a flexible professional dog trainer. I have a plan. When you hire me for training, I want to do A, B, C, and D. I want to accomplish what it is that you tell me you're looking for in your dog, and then I outline it in uh, six or eight or 10 or 12 week um, uh, training packages, whatever it might be. Hey, come here, Lucky. Come back up here. Come back up here. And, uh, but, I also recognize that during the course of those training sessions that I'm going to need to be flexible because there's going to be issues that pop up with that dog and that owner that maybe aren't part of what I had planned for that next training. And I'll need to address it. For instance, maybe I'll come to a training session and I'll say, how did it go this past week? And they might say, well, you know, the dog was great except uh, it bit the little boy next door. Well, now, you know, I can't really deal with whatever I was going to do that day in training. I need to address why this dog bit somebody and how to make sure that doesn't happen again. So that's what I mean about being flexible in my training. However, I have learned over time that basic obedience training, for instance, has a trickle up effect on so many other things that people um, uh, are hoping for out of their dog. And what I, what I mean by that is, 
it's sort of like it's sort of like going to a chiropractor, or at least my version of it. My apologies to chiropractors because I'm just ad living here the visual. But you might go to your chiropractor and tell them that your back hurts, and they might take your arm and start massaging your arm or moving muscles around in your arm. And you're in your mind, you're going, well, what the heck is this doctor doing? I told him my back hurts, not my arm. But that doctor may know that there's a direct direct link between this muscle group and uh, or tendons or whatever and the problem that you have in your in your back. And if I can relax this muscle group, it's going to relax the muscle group in your back and you're going to be all fine. Uh, it's not quite that simple, but we all kind of understand that concept, right? Well, well, dog training is sort of like that too. There's a trickle up, not a trickle down, a trickle up benefit to just the basic obedience training that I believe everybody should give to their dog. So while I might be teaching your dog something in the basic obedience categories, there may be something else that the dog never does in the future. It never occurs. He never bites anybody. He never jumps on grandma. There might be something that doesn't happen that the owners don't realize, and, and me even for that matter, benefited that dog's behavior not to do something else. So, if I, if, if I spend a lot of time teaching a dog how to greet me, then I don't have to worry when I go for a walk with my dog that, that the dog um, um, doesn't greet the people that we come across properly there. there that's just a, a wild example of what I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to get across. So the, the, the professional trainer that is helping you in the beginning may help you with things that you don't even know you paid that trainer to do. And this is where the crux of many of my uh, uh, comments that I received yesterday is because I had made the comparison to a professional, the cost of a pro professional trainer on say a dog that lives 10 years and, and let's say the cost to have that training done properly is $2,000, it comes out to less than $200 a year for the dog's dog training. To have a dog assimilate into your home and your family uh, nicely for the length of its life rather than you having to deal with the issues that you might have to deal with uh, without having that, that proper training. And, um, and, and I went on to compare that that $200 a year is probably less than what you might be paying for dog food and treats every month. Um, so if you make these comparisons, you can, you can understand that it's more of an investment. And I'm stealing that from my friend Craig Grayson, who made a comment on that video yesterday that he looks at something like this as an investment. Hey, Lucky. And he went uh, a little bit further. Come here, Lucky. Come up here. He went a little bit further. <laughs> you want to go outside, don't you? He went a little bit further by saying that not only does he look at it as an investment on, uh, on, on that breakdown of the cost being $200 a year, but he also went on to say... Um, about costs that maybe don't happen because of the professional training you, you gave your dog. The cost of not having to have a surgery because your dog ate something and caused a blockage. Or the cost of having a surgery because your dog ran into the road and got hit by a car. Things like that that don't exist. And you can even take it one step further. There's the cost of the inconvenience of the problem. Let me paint a picture of what I mean by the inconvenience. Well, we'll go back to yesterday's theme, and that was my friend's dog who runs out of their yard and uh, uh, ignores the invisible fence. Let's assume that happens um, early in the morning. It's still dark outside. 
you need to get to work very soon. It's raining, it's cold, it's miserable out, and now you're out there running around trying to find this black dog in the dark, rainy, cold, wet weather, a half an hour before you're supposed to be at a meeting at, at work. That's a major inconvenience. You can't even put a dollar value on when something like that happens, right? Of course, I just painted one of the most bleak pictures possible, but it does kind of seem that when there is a problem with your dogs, it's sometimes the worst case scenario. So maybe what I just outlined isn't far from the truth, right? So you have the, the cost that if you break it down over the lifetime of the dog uh, is minimal. You have the, the savings of the cost for potentially surgeries and, and, and uh, health issues that might exist because the dog got hit by a car, for instance. And you have the cost that you can't put a monetary value on of just the inconvenience of having to deal with that particular problem. So uh, I hope that I've addressed uh, everything, uh, all of the comments that I was receiving off of yesterday's video. Basically, people wanted me to be a little bit more detailed on what I meant by that. And of course, Lucky, come here. And of course, they wanted me to make sure that I had, uh, had one of our dogs in the video too. So hopefully this does a little bit more for you or somebody down in the road. And, um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. You can, you can find me, my email address is mike at regalcrestcanines.com. Our website's regalcrestcanines.com. And I'd be happy to try to address any issues that you might have with training your dog. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day.